Hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Behind the Cape. I'm superhero Keith Belanger, data superhero Keith Belanger. I'm joined by fellow data superhero Ian Whitestone. Thanks for joining us today, Ian. Thanks for having me. Excited to be here. Yeah, it's great to have you too, especially this topic. I, I'm very interested in this topic. And why don't you let our, all our guests know which specific topic we're going to be discussing today? Sure. So, uh, yeah, today's very exciting. It's a topic that's near and dear to my heart. It's something I've cared about for a long time, and that's... Um, data warehouse cost optimization. Well, I think, I think optimization period, and we can, you know, today we're going to cover a lot of topics, you know, both from a performance optimization uh, standpoint and a cost optimization standpoint. That's part of why this topic so exciting is, is oftentimes a way to, you know, lower costs is to make things run faster. And everyone loves when something runs faster. faster. So um, yeah. yeah, lots to it, dive into today. It is definitely a, a topic that I think is touches a lot of people in terms of, you know, one is observing what what your costs are, and then the other is is, is how do what do you do to um, to kind of reduce those or get more out of your dollars? So yeah, let's get right into it. Perfect. So um, so give me a little bit of, of of some background on the costs and the performance optimization and, and stuff like that that people would want to want to see. Sure. I mean, um, oh, where to start? Um, I think. I think the thing with, in terms of what people, um, what people want to see with, with cost optimization in, in Snowflake is really getting into a starting point, I guess, how I recommend people go about this is building up an understanding of um, what is their actual Snowflake usage. So a typical route that people can go down, which isn't necessarily the right way to do it, is they have an idea in their head of like, oh, I think our, we have all these unused tables and we should we should go tackle those, right? And really want to zoom out and build a holistic picture of um, what is actually driving your usage in Snowflake and then start to think about, okay, now that I've built up that understanding, where does it make sense to focus? And, and coming back to the example of storage, storage oftentimes makes up a small portion of, uh, you know, Snowflake customers bill. And I'm sure we'll get into the billing. We can touch yeah. on a bit on the billing model in a, later on, but um, I think that's with, with what I'd actually, you know, People, will, different customers will give you a different answer of what they want to see, but uh, I've, I'm pretty opinionated on what customers <laughs> should see and what they should look at right. um, when they go about doing this. Do, do you find a lot of customers out of the gate really have a good underhand handle and a grasp on really where all the costs come from? Um, you know, it really, it really varies. I think an amazing thing about Snowflake is you have so many different sizes, types, uh, maturity levels of businesses coming in to use the platform. And depending on that customer, they, I'll give you a different answer. Um, I would say in general, I think most customers who have spent a bit of time on this do have a, a rough sense of um, where their spend is. I will caveat th uh, that with it really depends on who you talk to in the organization. Many of the individual you know, people using the Snowflake platform won't necessarily know things. So I'm, I'm saying this from usually the perspective of um, you know, data platform lead uh, or or a data engineer who is who is administering the Snowflake instance. But I'd say they generally speaking have a good understanding at a high level of um, you know which services are, are necessarily driving spend. And maybe maybe um, we can jump into the billing model after because I think that would be a good a good place to ground a lot of these things for those who are new to this. But generally, good good understanding of like you know these services compute for example these virtual warehouses are driving my spend. And then I think where it gets trickier is, okay, you know, I know this warehouse spiked in costs. Why did that warehouse spike in costs and how can we go about identifying that, which we can um, get into today as well. Yeah, no, definitely. Um, so Snowflake gives you a bunch of levers and stuff, right? To, to really get optimized and efficiency in, in the cloud, right? Is that something you could kind of give a little bit more details on? Sure, sure. So, um, we, we can talk about levers. Let's let's really in like two seconds cover the billing model. So okay, um, perfect. Let's so, do that. So, yeah, just because then I can map to how the different levers, the other. you know, perfect. help let's help with there. those different components. So um, yeah, I think what's great about Snowflake and what makes it so attractive to so many people, especially compared to say ten years ago, um, before they before they really gained um, widespread um, usage in the market, was this pay pay per what you use. Um, model as opposed yeah. to this, you know, buy all this stuff up front and, you know, it's not flexible. So Snowflake is pay for what you use. So what does that mean? You pay for the 
um, amount of compute or amount of storage you're using. So right. um, in terms of what Snowflake bills you for, um, and, I'll, and I'll list these in descending order of what people typically um, pay for uh, or what, what people, people typically pay the most for on their bill. So okay. the biggest one is, is compute. Yeah. Um, that's the, uh, that's the core of, of, of Snowflake. It's a data warehouse. It provides flexible compute to run your queries. So these come in the form of virtual warehouses that customers, um, create that, you know, can run different workloads on them. So that, that typically represents like 80, 80% call it of, of customer spend. Um, after that you have storage. So Snowflake sits on top of the different cloud providers. Azure, Microsoft Azure, Google Cloud Platform, and AWS. When you load, um, and it's funny, we have to caveat all these things because Snowflake just keeps evolving, right? So we're right. going to talk about their their native storage format that most customers use, and ignore the the data lake aspect part that they're right. um, that they're coming out with. And we'll also just focus from an architectural standpoint and billing standpoint on the um, the data warehousing aspect, and not you know it's a full on data cloud. There's so right. many different things you can do. There's there's native apps coming. There's Unistore coming. Just to as a quick caveat, you know, we're, we're focusing on those. So the storage piece, customers load in their data into the, whatever cloud storage their cloud provider has. So S3, um, if you're on AWS and that, um, you know, is typically that 10 or 20% um, remaining. Um, so the, the, I think a, a big thing that's important to recognize with storage and Snowflake is they're not, um, that's not where they're, um, you know, driving margin or making money. They're not, uh, it's actually cheaper to store your data in Snowflake than uh, elsewhere, it, and and that's yeah, something and that, to, that's something it, that people it's it's great like and it's uh, something that no one talks about. That I, it's like it's actually cheaper to put your stuff in here. Because and I've of, had that conversation with clients that I'm working with. Like, well, we don't want to put it in Snowflake. We don't. They're leaving it in their S3 bucket or their blob storage. I'm like, no, no, it's going to be far less more far less expensive if you move it into into Snowflake. And really, yeah, well, yeah, there definitely is that perception. Yep. And we can we can dive into why that is later if yep. people are interested. But they're they're essential at a high level. They're able to compress it much okay. much better than what you would do, um, even if you're storing it in an efficient format like like right. Parquet. So, compute storage. Those are the big ones. Remember that storage isn't something that will typically be driving most of your spend, and also it's it's pass through pricing. So Snowflake's pretty much charging you what um, AWS charges them under the hood to put that right. there. Um, so compute is the layer that people typically need to focus on the most. There are a, a number of other services that um, people will will pay for that uh, I bucket under serverless features. So right. the reason I say serverless, it's a funny word because there's there's servers somewhere, servers just, you're not right. managing them. Um, these are features that people are probably familiar with like Snowpipe, which is a serverless loading feature. So instead of you spinning up your own warehouse, right. um, Snowpipe handles that out of the box for you. Um, in near real time to get your data loaded into Snowflake, uh, automatic clustering, materialized views, search optimization, query acceleration. These are all serverless features, things that Snowflake manages um, on your behalf to give you different benefits. And those, you know, those um, will typically make up a portion of, of people's bill. And that's when we see the most variance. But um, that's kind of the general ordering, compute, storage, serverless features. Um, so coming back to your uh, the original question you asked me, which is um, what are the uh, what are the lever? I think it was the what are the levers or controls that Snowflake yeah. gives you to kind of manage these? Was that yeah that yeah I think yeah what are the kind of level the levers and boy that word's being troublesome today. What are the <laughs> levers that we that they have the tools and the capabilities that they that they provide you to help right either see or control these these costs? Yeah, so let's let's start with visibility, um, and then we can get into the controls and guardrails um, yep. piece, because it, it's almost equally important as, as being able to see it as, as, as being able to have guardrails and, and controls in place. Um, so on the visibility side, um, oh, I'm gonna, I, I don't know the exact navigation path in the <laughs> classic uh, UI, but in um, Snowsight yep. itself, if you yep. um, click on, I think admin and then usage, um, you immediately get a pretty good experience out of the box with being able to dissect your um, your trend. So I think it starts, uh, of course, have this ingrained in my memory because I look at it so often, <laughs> but uh, it starts with a, you know, a view per account. There's so, so many Snowflake, uh, sorry, many organizations using Snowflake have multiple Snowflake accounts. 
They may do that for different environments. Um, a common one we see with, with customers we work with is they um, create different accounts to support data sharing with, with various customers. So they'll have them in the different regions of cloud providers. Um, some, some customers will choose to do um, account separation for um, just if it, there's an entirely different business use case, they will choose to segregate by account. So they give you this view that starts at account level. And from there, you can drill into individual accounts and see service by service. So like I, those services I listed that you, you get billed for, compute, storage, serverless, they give you a view of those. And then, you know, typically it's compute that's driving the spend. So you can drill into your compute and then see at a virtual warehouse level um, what is what is driving your your spend. So, so that's what they provide on like the cost visibility standpoint. And then, you know, there's also query level visibility they give. They have an amazing query profile, which I think we should touch on later once we perhaps get into some more um, specific performance techniques. But those are the those are the kind of visibility tools they're giving you from a cost and performance standpoint out of the box in the UI. With that said, um, those are just things they show in the UI. There is this beautiful, beautiful thing called the Snowflake metadata database that right. um, is the thing I actually probably spend the most time with, which is just hundreds um, of tables that Snowflake gives you under the hood through a data share, which is kind of cool. Every yeah. customer gets access to their own Snowflake metadata through this data share. And I would say that, uh, you know, it's not, it's kind of an indirect way they're giving you visibility is like, here's a bunch of tables, but, um, you know, this is part of how our product works and, and how many customers do this themselves when it comes to cost monitoring is they'll build up um, dashboards, monitoring, et cetera, on top of those detailed usage views, just because you can get so much more granular. I mean, if there's something that's happening in Snowflake, it's logged in one of these in one of these tables, which is um, really amazing um, that, that Snowflake provides such a rich level of metadata, like out of the box to all customers um, at, you know, in batteries included as, as part of as part of what you pay for Snowflake. So um, that covers any of the vis that covers the visibility stuff. Do you have questions on that before I like do you want to drill into no. before talking about the control no, piece? No, I think that's great. No, let's let's, let's keep on going. It's good stuff. Cool. Um, so yeah, on the control side, um, there are a number of different um, a number of different things that are available to Snowflake customers to um, alert, prevent um, on. Uh, higher than expected uh, or unwanted spent. So where to start? Um, I think one of the most obvious ones people have heard about is resource monitors. So today, um, resource monitors are a feature. Um, again, you can enable, I think, these under admin in the Snowsite UI. Um, there is uh, something you enable um, both through the UI and programmatically. That's another just a fanboy about Snowflake for a second. It's like everything uh, that you do in the UI can be done through a supported SQL standpoint, uh, through a SQL statement, which is why so many people love working with it and administering it. But yeah, you can create resource monitors. So what does a resource monitor do? A resource monitor sets a limit on how much, uh, how many credits, or just think dollars a particular warehouse or set of warehouses can cost in a given time period. And then they have different alerting mechanisms for that. So um, for example, send me a email when this warehouse reaches 90% of this level, or send me an email and um, immediately turn off all queries and prevent any more queries from running on that warehouse. Gotcha. So that's kind of the, that's the extreme end. One is a, a nice nudge saying, Hey, this is going <laughs> in. And then the other one's like, the door you, shut. you shall not pass. <laughs> like no more queries running on this. Um, yeah. So resource monitors are a very effective tool that very few pe people use. Um, I don't, I don't know why I think it's just a lack of awareness and people not sure of what they should put up, uh, put for a, a constraint. Um, but that's really a great tool to avoid surprises, um, yep. is you can, um, you can put this in place. So you, you know, based on, and what I suggest is people work backwards from their budget, right? They snowflake customers, unless you're on demand, you, and you can do this actually if you're on demand as well, but when you have a contract, you have a specified amount of money that you, you know, have set aside for snowflake each year and you can work from there to say, okay, um, how much do we want to allocate to these different warehouses or, or, or teams or departments and then assign limits accordingly. So resource monitors are um, one of the most known um, and best tools for controlling that. Another one um, is at the warehouse level itself, query timeouts. So what is a query timeout? A query timeout is a um, 
it can be a, I think a warehouse level setting. It may, it can also be a account level setting. I think it can be a session level setting. So there's different ways you can apply it, but I think warehouse is the most common place people yeah. will apply that. Um, what does this do? It is a limit for how long a query can run on a particular warehouse. And if we come back to that billing model, Snowflake pays, you pay for how often you're using the warehouse, you pay for each second a warehouse is up. So you are in turn paying if a query is running on a warehouse, you're in turn paying for how long, uh, how many seconds that query is running. So yeah. it is a way to minimize the amount of, I guess, damage or spend uh, you could, uh, a particular query could incur on a warehouse. And um, these are really powerful. And again, this is one of the things out of the box, which is I'm not sure why people don't use more. Um, I think because they're not probably not immediately uh, in, surfaced in the UI, like you don't see this warehouse as this query timeout. Um, we, we published a blog on this, so it walks through exactly how to set them. We can share a link to that later, but super quick, like everything, it's a single kind of alter resource statement, alter warehouse set query timeout equal to blah, right. and you put that in seconds. Yeah, I've seen um, like many organizations and folks, so they'll get into Snowflake and they just start using it and we'll come back to setting those things and they they never do. And, and, and to the example you yeah. bring up, I've seen somebody, hey, I'm going to start this because I'm going home for the weekend. They start it, they go home for the weekend, they come back on Monday and that query's still running, right? And Yeah, that, so that's that the, that's the classic example. For yep. sure. And it's in the future. So one, one piece of that give, and everyone knows about query timeouts, what I think people don't think about. And what I often see is people, they, that happens and then go on the extreme end and they go put like a, a five minute query limit on everything. And the thing you have to remember is Snowflake, um, something we didn't talk about building is, and we can get into warehouses and the size of them. Snowflake offers different size of warehouses in t-shirt size. So um, extra small all the way through six extra large, um, right. six XL. And each time you change a warehouse size, the cost of that warehouse doubles. Um, nice. What's great is yep. your queries also run twice as fast. So if you, are, if you are using, um, if you are putting queries that scale and take advantage of those larger resources, which we can talk about why that happens and how to identify that. Um, if, if you, so if you're using queries that should run on those warehouses, it essentially gets you the ability to run things twice as fast at the same cost, which is right. amazing. We talked about this, the first thing they call this, is the, one of the great things about optimization, you can often have things run um, much faster and, and lower costs or at the same cost. At the same um, cost. Yeah. So, Coming back to this, each uh, coming back to the query timeouts, each warehouse, uh, you double the cost. Um, what does that mean for query timeouts? Well, you should think about how you set your query timeout in terms of um, how much could a query possibly cost? So uh, extra small warehouse um, consumes two, uh, or sorry, one credit per hour. hour. How much does a credit cost? Call it two to, two to five dollars. Let's say three right. on average. So that two to five range for those who are curious, that depends widely on, um, well, first it depends on which plan of Snowflake you choose. So the lowest uh, plan you can choose is standard when it goes yeah. enterprise, business critical, uh, then, something, something after <laughs> super, we're, super we're deluxe taking, premium. We're not taking the test right now. So <laughs> yeah, sorry. Uh, so so th that's, that's, that can cause the, um, the credit price to range, but, uh, yeah. and then also how much you spend each year and how many years you sign a contract for. So right. call it $3 on average. So an extra yeah. small warehouse um, consumes one credit per hour, meaning um, it could cost, you know, if a query ran for an hour, it could cost $3. $3. Um, your, T and this is people don't think about this when they when they set these things like i would be ex i'm 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 now working i'm employed myself as a co-founder of a company but you know if i were working at another company doing this work i would be expensive i would cost that company hundreds <laughs> of thousands of dollars a year uh, i don't know what that works out to hourly but it's certainly a lot more than three dollars so right. you know you should not set a one hour query timeout limit on a extra small warehouse. Okay. You should think about it in terms of cost. Like what right. is the cost I want to mitigate by doing this? Where you may want to set a query timeout limit is on a 4XL. That is right. probably some place where you don't want to run something for an hour because, oh, now all of a sudden a ad hoc query, which, you know, who knows what the business value of that ad hoc query could be, um, you know, may suddenly cost thousands of dollars. So, dollars. And so, so that's the thing I want to leave people with is a very long winded, but hopefully makes sense <laughs> answer is um, when you think about doing these query timeouts, they're a fantastic tool for 
avoiding surprise costs like the weekend right. uh, runaway weekend example you gave. But when you go to put them in place, think about um, what's the warehouse size, how much, what's the maximum cost I'd want to allow for a query on this, um, and then you know right. add in some buffer. And that's how you should go about thinking about query timeouts. So um, super powerful. The the last one I'll provide very quickly. I know this has been a long answer, oh, but quick. a fun fun one to dive into. So controls for for managing spam. We talked about resource monitors. We talked about query timeouts. Um, I'd say a third one that people don't think about, but it's an indirect one is, is access control. So yeah. another one of the reasons people love Snowflake is how um, comprehensive it is and configurable it is from a security standpoint. Right. Um, so what the, and, and people think about that from purely security standpoint, but it actually has a cost angle to it as well. Right. So if you can... Um, I, I can't remember if you said this on the recording or before the recording, but you know, people jump into Snowflake, you all of a sudden have 10 people, 12 people you know, administering Snowflake, spinning up their own warehouses. Right. Um, this is uh, something that can be solved through um, you know, access control and a bit, of, a bit of company process and policy where um, do you let every person in the company you know, create these Great, different warehouses? Do you let yeah. every person in the company access each of these warehouses, right? Yep. So those are different layers. You can, you can control who gets to create resources and configure things. You can, um, you can control who gets to run queries on which resources. So, um, yep. you know, an easy way to, to think about, um, and, and this is always a, you know, this is always a tough one because you're, you're balancing, you're, you're, you're walking the fine line of, I want my, everyone in my team, um, again, people, you know, data developers, scientists, engineers, analysts are expensive. So you want them to be able to move quickly. So it's this balance between letting them do that and um, also preventing potential unnecessary, potentially wasted usage yeah. um, on your Snowflake. So that is another lever that I think people don't think about, but it's an important one is using access control that, that Snowflake offers again out of the box to um, control who can create resources, who can kind of run queries on which resources um, and, you know, how to do that kind of varies business by business, but it is a, it is another thing you have in your back pocket. Yeah. I've seen a lot of organizations when I've gone to new snowflake customers, right? They may have come from an Oracle or a Teradata or somebody, something like that. And there's a whole new um, set of things you need to administer from a snowflake perspective. And I've seen many go off to training and like, look at all these capabilities we can do zero copy cloning, and we can do create virtual warehouses. And they give those people a little bit too much freedom. And next, thing you know, your, your warehouses are out of control where I try to tell people that, no, let's really scale back how much of these capabilities we give the, the everyday uh, developer the ability to do. So like you said, I, I've seen hundreds and hundreds of virtual warehouses being created with no governance on top of them. And it, it gets, it, that's when you start seeing the bill can go can go crazy. So so we, we don't have a whole heck of a lot of time left, but I do have one, it, maybe it could be some, just some quick tips on like some query type of best practices that could really help with with possibly with, with helping with cost management and stuff like that. Mm. Maybe I'll uh, I'll rephrase. Uh, I'm gonna cheat and and, okay. and bend the question to maybe just answer. anything you know <laughs> anything people could do for, yeah. for cost management because and, and the reason I say that is um, that this is something people often think is um, oh I bet there's um, you know a bunch of queries we go, go to all this complex query optimization and right. that does exist but that's not where I recommend people start right okay. so I recommend people start with um, first understanding your bill right? Then understanding what are the drivers of those. And what you'll often see is there's, you know, a certain virtual warehouse that is driving right. a lot of spend or some new warehouses that have um, popped up or a batch of warehouses, right? And once you, once you have that understanding, you can then start to be targeted of, okay, um, like the example I gave at the beginning, like jumping into unused tables. No, those often don't drive spend. So think about right. um, starting with which of those things uh, is actually driving the spend. Um, so oftentimes you'll have compute, and this is why I'm bending your question. Oftentimes you'll have <laughs> compute be the largest um, driver of spend, which is driven by queries, but it can also be driven by inappropriate, or I shouldn't say inappropriate, but um, the wrong settings, right? So Snowflake gives you all this flexibility with choosing the virtual warehouse size, um, how many you can create, what purposes you create for them. Oftentimes there's lots of low hanging fruit there with how you set those up. So um, I don't know how much time we have to go into examples of this, but like in terms of tips, that's where I recommend people start right. is at the virtual warehouse level. 
are your warehouses sized correctly? Um, what are your auto suspension settings? Do you have, how many different warehouses do you have? I think a common um, pattern I see with, with corporations and I'm sure you're similar is lots of warehouses, one for each team, um, maybe even multiple for each team, depending on the use case. And right. this has great properties in that it gives you very good, because remember we talked about in the Snowflake um, yeah. dashboard, it gives you cost per dashboard or per cost per warehouse yes. um, in their dashboard. So, so a lot of times people set things up in a way that gives them that cost visibility. The visibility. The downside of doing that is you can have inefficient usage of those warehouses. So they're not fully utilized. So this is, um, you know, a big tip I have people, people uh, recommend people look at and something we help our customers with is understanding utilization of those warehouses. And, and then the, the next step from there is like, could we potentially combine workloads, consolidate workloads onto the same warehouses? And then there's some other ways you can do cost attribution because now you have this shared workload um, you can calculate a cost per query, which we can share some resources for how to do uh, at the end or separately in the links. Um, and then you can do that. You can achieve the same level of cost transparency in this consolidated warehouse. So warehouse um, warehouses is usually where I recommend starting to come back to your question. Are they sized correctly? Do we have auto suspension where it should be? Do we have the, you know, do we have too many warehouses? And then, and then you go into the queries. So once you're confident there, then you can go into the queries um, and I don't know if I will, maybe out of time, but clustering yeah. is the big thing there. No, I mean, and that's what I think we're, we're really showing here is that we could go on for, for a long period of time talking about this, but we are coming to an end. But that being said, Ian, where can people find a little bit more information about these tips and, and ideas and things that you, you, you have to share with people? Yeah. So, um, bunch of places. Uh, the, the first one I'll call out is our company, Select. So that's Select is in the SQL statement. Uh, <laughs> part of the motivation behind naming it. I'm amazed we got the domain. So select.dev, we, uh, myself and my co-founder, who's a fellow data superhero, Niall Woodward, we spend a lot of time writing content, um, things we wish we knew when we were starting out on this journey. So we have a big um, corpus, let's say, of, of content that people can use that covers all the things we chatted about. That's one. Um, the Snowflake docs are incredible themselves. Um, you just have to spend the time to go through. They cover a lot of these different things that we we talked about, how to configure readers from runners, how to configure query timeouts. Um, that's a great resource. Um, if you're going to be at Snowflake Summit, um, there's going to be a lot of talks I know that are focused on this. So just take a look through. Um, take a look through. I think that you may even be able to filter by category with Summit of like optimization and best practices. Um, the data superheroes, uh, a few of us will be doing a panel on this, so be sure to check that out. Um, what else am I missing here? There's some pre-baked, if you're using Tableau or Looker, there's some pre-built dashboards that uh, go a bit deeper than what Snowflake gives you in the UI, so that's a good place to start. Um, and yeah, I mean, it goes without saying, but uh, if anyone is looking for help with this, you're welcome to um, uh, get access to our product. That's select.dev is the website, and you can um, sign up through there and this is uh, something we do for a living. So um, lots more we could chat about there. I think we definitely should do a second. Uh, a yeah, second we might one have, I, have to we do barely a just covered the surface of, uh, you know, how people should think about this and like what are, you know, I, I, I dodged your question, but I have so much stuff on, on query uh, optimization specifically. We, maybe we can just uh, do a whole show into. on query optimization of uh, with, with Snowflake. So yeah. uh, we'll definitely have to do another part, but I appreciate your time, Ian. Thanks for joining us for everybody. We will put all of those links that Ian shared here during the, during the, our little show and uh, so that you can reference those links and hopefully we'll see some of you at summit. But again, thanks Ian for joining us today. Uh, it was, it was a pleasure. Yeah. Thanks for having me. And yeah, hope to, hope to run into some of you at summit as well. Yeah. Thanks everybody. So, thanks.